Welcome. My name is Michael Schroeder from the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Boards Planning Division. And along with Carrie Christensen, we'll be presenting uh, the preferred concept for Graco Park. Uh, we will have this presentation cover some background on the park, uh, some of the preferred concepts, and at the end, we'll have our consultants, Ani Fernandez, Landscape Architects, and Snow Krylik Architects, presenting directions for the landscape and the building of the park. We started this process with an understanding that the, the, the site has a long context. We can imagine perhaps what it was like um, before 1885 when it was potentially covered in trees and home to the Dakota people. Um, there was development that eventually happened as Minneapolis uh, began to grow and the site uh, began to evolve into uh, an industrial operation. Um, and that operation continued with the Shear Brothers Lumber Company occupying the site um, most recently until 2010. Since then, the buildings have been raised and the park board has been in a process of uh, planning its future as a park. What's important about the work that we've done in the last several years is, is a, a major evolution to the landscape of not only the site, but the river. The image on the left shows what the site was like in 2010. Uh, after we acquired the property and removed all the improvements from the Shear Brothers Lumber Company. And then following the directives of the River First uh, vision plan for the Upper River, the Park Board began the process of creating or recreating Halls Island. Um, as imagined both in the River First plans and in lots of studies that we did, um, working with many different agencies and eventually establishing in 2017, uh, the image on the right, uh, which is the reconstructed Halls Island. A significant stepping off point for our work was uh, the resolution of litigation that the park board is going through with uh, Graco. Um, at, the, at the time of some of the, the early planning, uh, there were questions about the impacts of the trail on, on Graco's operation. But since, in, since then, in 2018, we moved through a settlement process, which um, resulted in several significant things happening. Lot one, as you can see on this diagram, was sold to Graco. Um, lot two was retained uh, by the park board. Those were the original parcels that comprised what was previously known as lot uh, D. The East Bank Trail had been largely completed at the time of the settlement of the Graco, um, but the, the park board gained the trail easement behind the Graco Riverside plant for free. And importantly to the progress of this project and actually accelerating its delivery was a gift from the Graco Foundation of just a little over $3 million that would be directed towards the park's uh, development. Um, the, 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 we will also be as a part of this, uh, working toward cr the creation of a flood barrier um, that will um, help to protect Graco's uh, industrial operations from a major flood event. And significantly, the park um, gained a name. It hadn't had a name up to this point, and the, the, the Board of Commissioners uh, directed that the park be named Graco Park um, as a part of the settlement. We've been in this process with the public. We had a, a, a project that really started in June and July uh, of this year, and there was a, a round of uh, engagement around the launching of the project. We have been moving through several different rounds of, of engagement focused on um, trying to figure out the uses of the building, developing a series of concepts, which some of you may have seen. And now we're in this period of engagement um, to look at what uh, people are, 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 how people are going to be responding to the, the preferred concept. Probably in early 2022, or maybe, um, uh, that definitely in, in early 2022, we'll be moving through the final concept approval. That's a review by the Board of Commissioners. And as soon as we have that in hand, we'll be moving toward uh, the preparation of documents to allow the park to be uh, constructed with construction potentially starting late in 2022, but certainly in 2023. Well, when, when we look at Graco Park, uh, it's situated in a unique location in the riverfront where we have the beginnings of the Velda Falls um, and the north side, upstream side of the Plymouth Avenue Bridge and the central uh, Mississippi River, the Riverfront Regional Park, south of 
the Plymouth Avenue Bridge. And Graco Park becomes a really important connecting point between the two, but it's not the only park resource in the area. This diagram begins to identify those parts of the park system that, that are both regional and uh, neighborhood park oriented. And as we are, are planning for the park, we wanna make certain that we are recognizing uh, the resources that exist in nearby parks so we're not being duplicative and that we can put Graco Park to its best potential uh, use for the public. There are several factors that uh, are uh, influencing a design for the park. Um, they include the, the future building site that Graco may look at on lot one, which is toward the top of this diagram. Um, there are amazing views of downtown and just the riverfront in general from most portions of, the, of what we'll call Graco Park. There's a need to um, look at, importantly, at circulation patterns. As I mentioned, this is a, a connecting point for the East Bank Trail and for folks who want to move to the Central Riverfront area. And, and there are three potential connection points. One is crossing at uh, Sibley, crossing Plymouth and 8th Avenue at Sibley. A second, as was planned or considered in the River First plan was a passage underneath the Plymouth Avenue Bridge. And the third, which is an idea we're exploring uh, with this plan is an underpass. Uh, each one of those had some uh, merits. And right now we are focused on uh, the creation of the underpass that will create a safe uh, connection without having uh, to cross streets uh, for several miles going downstream all the way to, to, uh, to Hennepin Avenue. Um, and then connecting to going upstream or northward all the way to the far end of, of Sheridan Memorial Park. The connectivity becomes really important as we look at the, the idea of completing um, the recreational connections are necessary in the above the falls regional park. So those connections that we're looking at that the, the link between the two regional parks become critical to the design of the park. So as was mentioned, um, you know, we, we both looked at the technical aspects of the site that Michael just covered and then um, have also engaged with communities throughout and, and park board staff and other agency partners uh, to solicit their feedback on the various concepts that we'll be sharing with you here shortly. Um, so in our first round of engagement, we, uh, we, you know, we've had two rounds of engagement so far. The second round was really sharing out these, these three concepts. And now we're about to share our final preferred concept with you. Um, you see the, the different ways that we engage listed below the meeting recap and sort of who we heard from on the right of the slide here. Um, one of the goals for us at the park board is to work to engage a representative population that reflects the city of Minneapolis. Um, and have gotten very close to that in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, gender and age. Um, so feeling great about sort of the turnout and really grateful to all the voices that have that have come out um, to share him, input on Graco Park over the last six to nine months. Not to mention over the last decade of sort of deeper planning and uh, long-term planning for the area. So some of the things that we've heard, um, we've got both the first and second rounds of engagement listed here. And these are what folks would like to prioritize or see in the park, uh, in the site as a whole. So you'll see nature and habitat was called out uh, really strongly. Um, certainly activities all year round, the trail as a really critical component of the, um, of the park, trees, market spaces, having um, multiple functions in the park, uh, watercraft, Sort of access to human powered watercraft like canoes and kayaks. Um, in round two, definitely a lot of interest in the trail and the trail underpass concept. Um, lots of different conversations around island access and uh, whether it be physical or even just visual and how do we connect the park to the island um, visually and then think about also the role that habitat plays both on the island and in the park and what's the balancing act there for us. Um, always lots of interest in shade and trees and um, creating natural spaces along our river, both for wildlife and humans alike. It is in Northeast Minneapolis, of course, and which is a thriving arts district um, just nearby. And so certainly um, lots of interest in, in public art, but also interpretation of the history of the site. 
There was also some feedback given for the building uh, or the buildings potentially in the future. And um, so strong connections around park activation, uh, sustainability, wildlife friendly design. Um, how do we think about activating the park, um, not just visually, but also programmatically, what are we doing in the building to kind of bring life to the park? Uh, in terms of other kind of more technical aspects, like what do we think about with parking? We've got this big parking lot across the street at Boom Island. Um, so how do we maximize park use in this site? Um, how do we think about potential uh, connection to Sibley Street? And what is the relationship between moving from along the trail and potentially under the underpass or coming from the street? And what are all the different ways that we're accessing the building and then, um, and then connecting to the river? To evolve from the previous designs that were that were presented in the River First concept, our design team looked at a series of different concepts, each one trying to focus on a different aspect uh, of, of, of the site and how it would develop. Ultimately, there were a series of principles that kind of rang true. They included making certain that connections between the parks and through the parkway system was important. So the underpass connection to Boom Island Park became a, a piece of this that was that was important, as was improvements to the intersection at 8th and Sibley, keeping the buildings farther from the riverfront where they would be less prone to interfere with kind of the nature, natural activities that seemed important and resonated with a lot of folks who were reviewing these plans became important. Um, providing a large open space uh, for kind of uh, freeform, unprogrammed activities uh, was something that became important and you see You'll see that as we go forward, and and, and importantly, making sure that certain that we um, respect uh, the parameters under which Halls Island was allowed to be created. The permissions that were granted by the DNR were with the idea that it would become habitat. So, with that in mind, we really focused on not connecting to the island, providing views to the island, and actually allowing the idea of habitat and nature to extend and become kind of the foundation for landscape and topography as we look at how Graco Park would evolve. Thank you, Michael and Carrie. I'm Carlos Fernandez with Ani Fernandez Landscape Architects, and I'm going to introduce uh, the design influences, history and habitat in an urban park uh, that impacted and helped shape the uh, preferred design concept. Uh, the site being the former Sherrod Brothers uh, a lumber site uh, poses a really interesting narrative to us and it really is uh, represented by the relationship of the natural environment and in particular in northern Minnesota. Uh, the Mississippi River as the vehicle that brought material uh, to the site and the processing of the material on the site, the industry at the uh, Sherrod Brothers mill site. And so there's a dynamic story and a dynamic narrative here that connects um, a larger region uh, within the state, uh, but it also connects natural environment, uh, what it produces, how we move that those goods with the river and uh, what it becomes on site. And so that became a very interesting narrative to us uh, because of the fact of the, the directive of the park to become really immersed in habitat. And so where we are at today is really an exploration of looking back at the natural environment to inform what the design of the park can become today. Um, we've assembled a team of uh, experts uh, on the project that we've been working with, uh, zoologists, uh, ecologists, uh, restoration ecologists and specialists, as well as the folks that worked on the Halls Island project itself, uh, both the engineers and designers, as well as the people that uh, did the construction and uh, restoration work for the island. They've also been uh, maintaining the island since it was completed. And so we have uh, assembled all of the folks that know the most about this project and have been actively involved in, in establishing the habitat um, uh, adjacent to the site. And so it's both um, the island itself, which focuses on a canopy system and prairie meadow system, uh, and the channel itself, a river system, which focuses on uh, mussels, mammals, fish, and turtles in different ways. Um, those three habitat systems are what informs the design of Graco Park and uh, what it will become over time. Halls Island um, is what Graco Park is about. 
uh, the preservation of it and um, the support of the island itself and its, its growing and establishing habitat. Um, in the yellow, uh, you can see areas that are planned to be uh, prairie meadow or in the case of Halls Island establishing uh, now. In areas in green, we diag diagrammatically show where we're planting uh, tall canopy uh, overstory trees. Um, those are all uh, very important structural systems uh, to allowing habitat to function. And so in particular, and, and really uh, one of the best habitat opportunities we have is with the river system. Um, when it was built, it was built with a, a stable gravel bed and shallower water, and it really is prime habitat for uh, establishing mussels. Uh, for mammals in particular, uh, what we were focusing in on is the idea of structure. Uh, these structures allow mammals to get in and out of the river. We know there are otters that use this specific area of the river. There's also beavers, uh, mink, uh, and, and other uh, mammals that are uh, living and using this area. Uh, if you look on the right side of the slide, you'll see all of the species that we've specifically researched and have been uh, designing for as we've moved through the process. Um, that river system and the introduction of structure in particular buried logs uh, for sunning turtles provides a habitat links that enable predator prey relationships and the ease of access between upland and lowland areas and <clears throat> mimics some of the uh, type of deadwood and driftwood that you'd see in areas that are more naturalized. The canopy system really supports uh, this site as part of the Mississippi River Flyway. Uh, birds need the upper story canopy uh, for a variety of reasons, and um, we have uh, robust plantings throughout the site. Uh, there are also other things that can be done uh, for the birds uh, in, in the form of structures as well, uh, nest boxes, uh, perch uh, structures, uh, and other features, different types of nesting opportunities that allow uh, birds to more easily inhabit the site and use the habitat. Uh, on the prairie meadow system, uh, it's really a, a mixed plant community of prairie species, and it really um, provides an opportunity for uh, pollinators uh, to uh, inhabit the site. Um, again, we began exploring opportunities for structures and how structures can uh, work with uh, the habitat that's being planted and established. Um, and, uh, and so there's a variety of pollinators that can be supported uh, on site through different types of design and restoration moves. Uh, and there's also opportunities for snakes and uh, which is a real interesting thing to talk about and look at. Uh, so we'd mentioned the structures. And so these are the types of things that you would see uh, starting to appear in the park. Um, on the upper left is uh, a bee house uh, where different types of uh, bee species uh, can live. Uh, if we move to the right from there, uh, these are simple logs that get weighted down and anchored essentially into the shoreline areas. They become critical structures for mammals uh, and turtles, especially turtles. They need this sunning structure so that they can get out and warm their bodies. Uh, there's a canopy tree image with a large nest in it and kind of jumping over the butterfly, that's sort of the counterpart to how a built structure can begin to support birds of prey. Uh, in particular with the island, there's great opportunities to try and attract eagles and or osprey uh, to a nest structure. Um, the prairie itself provides a structure and uh, for pollinators of all different types. In the lower left is a, a bat house structure. This site is prime bat habitat with adjacent to water and still water. Um, it's an excellent opportunity to explore that. Uh, the otters uh, in the middle, uh, they do create nests in the banks of the river. And so, uh, you know, we can hope that they would, they would uh, eventually do that, but certainly use the area uh, in, a, in a predator prey capacity. And then the last image on the lower right is examples of how a drift would provide structure of different types. And not to forget that there's a human element here and uh, we are in a park. As you can see that uh, some of these structures and beach conditions, uh, people began to arrange them and do interesting things with them so that the structural components of, of, the, of the habitat really start to integrate uh, human activity as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jason uh, to uh, take you through the preferred design. Thanks, CJ. My name is Jason Ali, landscape architect and designer from AFLA. I'll be talking 
to you today about the preferred concept, and then I'll be taking you through an animation of the design. First, I wanna share a little bit with you about how we uh, got to the point of the preferred concept. Um, and some of the design principles we use to, to get to this answer through a lot of the public engagement. Um, so the first design principle was to celebrate the river and Halls Island. The second is to maximize habitat, shade, solar gain, and stormwater features of the site. Third is to have the ability to touch and interact with the water. And fourth is to interpret the site's uh, rich, rich history. Um, taking in these principles into consideration, um, it shaped the spaces and the landscape around the preferred concept. Here at the preferred concept, the site's organized with five main features. Um, these features are two broad um, promenades that reach out and touch the water. Um, secondly, is this river walk that patterns its uh, form after the water. Um, fourth are the building and plaza areas. Fifth is the flexible green. So if I take you to from number 20, where, where there will be intersection improvements for um, pedestrian and bicycle crossing at Plymouth and Sibley, that leads down what we're terming as Halls Island Promenade, which, um, the surface would be converted into a boardwalk at number seven and six. Um, this is where the kayak rental building would be and the launching point to the river at number 16. This is the boat landing area. And then this promenade, the terminus, is the bird of prey sculpture um, that CJ had talked about. Leading northward is what we're terming the river walk on number nine. Here there would be heavy timber seating plantings, uh, lighting, and it really, be, really becomes an area where people can interact with the different habitat structures and actually touch the water. There'll be seating areas right along the river. Transitioning north to number 10, um, this is a river gathering space, more of a informal amphitheater. Uh, up to number 11, this is what we're calling the Halls Island Overlook or Promontory. Um, this will be an opportunity to overlook Halls Island itself, and it's an exact view back towards the downtown skyline. This is, this is where we will tell the story of the uh, site's rich history and building of Halls Island itself. Stretching back through the past another uh, picnic shelter, and then now you're on 18, the regional trail. Um, which passes back through the building area. And then through the, on the building area, which Snow Krylik will cover in detail, um, to the north is organized a, a performance green. To the west is organized a flexible green, which will be a nice green uh, bowl of space. And to the south uh, is where there'll be a sculptural water feature, another picnic shelter, and then functional stormwater gardens and wave benches. So, uh, vegetation wise, we see that this is gonna be overstory floodplain canopy. This will transition into prairie areas on the north and south prairie areas directly adjacent to the buildings. And then within a lot of these areas on the right hand side, what you'll see is you'll see asterisks uh, and we're planning on incorporating stormwater into as many features as we can um, to cleanse it before it hits the Mississippi River. And with that, I'm gonna remain a little bit quiet as we go through the animation. I'll mention certain things, um, but we'll be going through the animation right now. All right, here we are at the start of the animation. We're at the corner of uh, Sibley and Plymouth, and we're gonna be uh, taking a fly through through Graco Park. Here we are passing along what's called Halls Island Promenade. On your right, you'll see the picnic shelter. And as we turn here, you'll see the main entrance to the building, Stormwater Plaza, 
timber wave benches and artful water feature. Progressing down Hall's Island Promenade at the terminus, you'll see the bird of prey sculpture transitioning into boardwalk. On the left, you see the kayak rental building. And then we'll be transitioning to the river walk where there's different habitat opportunities on the river um, to interact with different log structures and boulder structures. As you walk along the river walk, there's opportunities for different heavy timber seating that reflects the history of the site, timber lighting, different vegetation types. And then we're walking under the high forest canopy. Transitioning here, you'll see the river gathering space. As we turn, you'll see one of the broad promenades reaching back to the site. Transitioning up, now we'll come to the Halls Island Promontory. And this is where um, we'll tell the story of the site, the story of Halls Island. And you get a great view here, looking back to the city. We'll be flying up over Halls Island and all the habitat. Looking back towards the park. And here we cross the Plymouth Avenue Bridge and we're on the north side of Boom Island Park. And here, we'll be flying through what would be the proposed new regional trail and underpass to the project. So we're moving from Boom Island into Greco Park. We're on the regional trail. The regional trail will transition up towards the building and around the site. Here we're overlooking the river walk and the flexible green. There's the multi-use building that Snow Cralic will be talking in detail about. On the north side here, we see the performance gathering area. As we take off up here, we're gonna be going back down into the plaza area. Featured in the plaza area will be these timber wave benches and sculptural stormwater cells and sculptural water feature. As we fade out here, we'll be looking at a bird's eye perspective of the building area and what would be the preferred concept for Greco Park. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, before we move forward to the building concept, we wanted to uh, cover a few other items related to the site design and um, in particular, uh, the first item is the treatment of the intersection at Plymouth and Sibley. Uh, although a future route of the regional trail may uh, utilize the underpass and go directly through the park, there still will be a trail connection as well as roadside uh, bike lanes that all move through this intersection. Uh, because there, it is a slope down coming off the bridge, uh, vehicles have 
uh, higher speeds moving across that intersection. And so there's some, some real safety concerns for both crossing, but also just vehicle speeds moving into the uh, neighborhood beyond. So our uh, team is looking at uh, different options for improving the safety at that intersection. In addition to that, as we went into the design, um, we really looked at how this uh, park will be resilient over time, uh, really from three different uh, perspectives. Uh, one, flood mitigation. Uh, the river flooding is a, a major issue. It could also cause a lot of damage. Uh, 812 was established as the flood platform that's above the 100 year flood plain, four feet above it. And this line right here and this area is all at uh, 812 or above it. And you'll notice that the buildings and kind of the major investment that gets put into these structures uh, is on top of that flood plain. Uh, that represents um, uh, a 10% chance every year that the flood, uh, the yearly, the spring flood would, can reach that elevation. Uh, so what that means is 90% of the time, or there's a 90% chance every year that uh, areas to the right of that 805.5 stay dry. And so when you looked at our animation uh, along the edge of the walk, you notice steps and some small walls. Uh, those are implemented to make sure that uh, the vast majority of the time, the park and, and that walk in particular stays out of the flood. This helps with uh, not having to do yearly maintenance and cleanup related to uh, areas that get impacted with floods as well as simply protecting um, uh, the improvements that are being made along. Uh, vegetation is also uh, looked at from a resiliency standpoint. And so uh, that means that we have a diverse uh, canopy and different uh, tree species. Uh, we've introduced uh, conifers uh, into the uh, taller deciduous canopy forest. Uh, that diversity of tree species gives us protection against disease and bugs uh, that result in larger um, uh, forest kill off like we're seeing with ash currently. Uh, and then last is access and circulation, uh, largely maintenance and safety driven. Um, we mentioned earlier that food trucks would come in and park in these areas and bring that service to the park. Uh, they're accommodated with a vendor loop that allows for easy entry, forward drive through, no backing up movements and then back out to the street uh, where they can exit. Uh, all of the other trails and pathways, including the vendor loop then are drivable for maintenance vehicles and for uh, patrolling uh, to uh, to ease the access and then the safety uh, of the park. This is a, a, a portion that's not in the video, but it's being reserved for future park building uh, if that were ever to be needed. Uh, noted with the number fives are the two open air shelters that you saw uh, in the video. Six is the boat kayak rental building. Uh, Eleven is the observation deck of Halls Island. And 13 is the uh, large uh, bird of prey structure uh, that becomes really kind of an iconic symbol or sculpture um, uh, at the park in Halls Island. And so those elements uh, would not be implemented with this phase of construction and would have to uh, be done with the future phase. There are a few reasons that we arrived at these elements for uh, future development. One is the extensive engagement that we've done today and what we've heard from the community uh, uh, across the board is their priorities. Uh, second is the availability of budget. Uh, third is uh, construction phasing and constructability and our ability to come in and implement these improvements at a later point in time and not disrupt or have to demo out or, or remove portions of what's being built now uh, is an important consideration um, for how you would make improvements in the future. And so there is an ease of access and construction ability, constructability that um, is evaluated when identifying these elements for uh, future implementation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Snow Krylik uh, to talk about the building concept. Thank you. Hi, here at Snow Krylik, we're super excited to be part of this project. The architecture of Braco Park needs to act as a vehicle to create social space and to bring us to our own waterfront. The architecture has to be adaptable to many different types of gatherings serving many different types of communities. We also think it's incredibly critical for this project to demonstrate how we might approach carbon neutrality and energy efficiency within our park buildings.
plan and the program for Graco Park building really reflects that idea of flexibility and inclusivity, making sure that it's welcome for all users by being flexible in its use. There are several multi-use spaces in the building. Um, one, a large multi-purpose space with a view to the river, a porch outside of that multi-purpose space that could be used for performance, what we're calling a commons, which is an area that could be used by anyone in the community to work from home in the park or other uses, a shared conference room, and a creation space, which is part of the park board's project to um, introduce teens to creativity and uh, technology. The building also includes several restrooms, both gender neutral and gender assigned, a shower, uh, for use by the community and a reception desk that would be staffed um, during open hours. In developing the design of the project, we were inspired by the historic use of the site as a lumber yard and mill. Particularly, we are inspired by the gabled forms of the lumber sheds, the texture of the stacked wood uh, on the site, and the material qualities of the timber itself. How would we tran translate these historic precedents into a building that was cutting edge, high performance, and that met the challenges of our era? We've created a long pitch roof structure that's oriented east-west to harvest beneficial solar gain and renewable solar energy from the south. The, stru the structure, structural frame of this building is a carbon neutral mass timber frame this is clad with a high performance envelope of super insulated walls and triple pane bird friendly glass. The building is further clad by a, by a wood slat shading scrim that shades openings on the east, west and south facades and extends to the west to create a porch for performance spaces and gathering. The building is powered in large part by the sun and the thermal capacity of the earth. The mechanical engine of the building is a geothermal heat pump uh, that uses the heating and cooling capacity of the earth to reduce uh, the energy use of the building. The remaining energy needs of the building are offset by a 20 kilowatt uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaic array on the south roof that transforms solar power into electricity. Stormwater gathered on the building roof is filtered and absorbed by a stormwater garden in front of the building that reduces the, the loads on the municipal stormwater system. Now we'd like to take you through some views of the project. This is a view from the park entry at Sibley and Plymouth. On the right is the main building with the creation space positioned to the far east of the building. On the left is a shade pavilion. We've positioned the building forms as close to the street as possible to leave as much space as possible for habitat and outdoor uses. You approach the building entry through, through a stormwater garden and children's play space and look through to the building commons. At the west river facing end of the building, the wood slat scrim ex extends out from the building form and creates a porch-like space where gatherings and performances can occur. The multi-purpose space is a versatile 40 foot by 40 foot space that looks out to the river and opens out to the west facing porch. The space can be used for a variety of public activities from exercise classes to public meetings, to fine arts performances, or workshop activities such as boat building. So thank you so much for tuning in and learning about the Graco Park design process. And um, we'd love to hear from you. We have an engagement website open for comments. There's a survey that you can fill out and take a closer look at the um, concept and some of the background information. Please hold these questions in your mind as you look at the at the preferred concept, what questions do you have about it? What do you like about the site and building? And what concerns you? Just a reminder that our, our 
process is rolling along and we hope to come uh, bring a final concept to our board for approval in early 2022 and then start to move into deeper design development and um, construction documents and go out this spring is the plan for bids. So start to move into the construction phase, uh, which we hope to start in um, fall of 2022. Here's the information on how to get engaged. My contact information, if you're interested in reaching out, we're happy to come speak to your group. If there's anyone uh, or any groups you'd like to kind of engage on this process, in this process, we will be um, out in community until mid to late January, 2022, um, getting feedback on the preferred concept. There's an engagement page where you can submit your comments and then the, the larger project page uh, for tracking progress and sign up to stay in touch is listed there too. Thank you so much.